Here we go. Okay, perfect. Shall we start now then? I think it's it. Okay. <coughs> well, Andrew, for the for the people that don't know you, maybe can you give um, a first introduction of yourself rapidly to for people to understand who you are, what you were doing before, and what you are doing now. Okay, uh, so six, 60 seconds. So um, I was 30 years in financial services in the city of London mainly, uh, HSBC for almost 20 years, Lloyds Bank, and then for the last two or three years I've been working for um, uh, pension companies. Um, so I work mainly in London, but uh, Hong Kong, Bangkok, Tokyo, Madrid, in my time, I've been seconded by the various banks that I've worked for. Uh, middle of last year, it was, it was the heat of the summer, the IPCC 1.5 degree report, and particularly reading Jem's uh, deep adaptation paper that suddenly made uh, it all feel wrong that I was continuing to work for a pension company that, that let's face it, encourages young people to save for the next 20, 30 or 40 years so they can have some financial security in their, in their old age. Um, so I gave up my job clearly from a position of privilege, not, not needing to worry about a roof over my head or food on the table. Uh, that was January this year. Uh, I became within about a month uh, a full-time volunteer with Extinction Rebellion. And um, I've been arrested three times this year. First time in April on Waterloo Bridge. Um, then I, then I uh, entered the European elections as an independent candidate. And then finally um, at home because in the last two or three months, I've had some more significant roles in my volunteer work with the Extinction Rebellion. I lead the finance team, and I've also been supporting on in an administrative capacity uh, one of the co-founders, Roger Hallam. So that's basically me. Okay, thanks for for the introduction. I think it's um, it's very interesting. So we we can go in a lot of different avenues from there. But if it's possible, can you detail us your thought process for going towards climate change activism? What, what has been the trigger and how far has it been with you, this sort of climate change? Have you been made aware? Yeah, References so if you have. I know you've written your article on Medium. Yeah. If people are interested, we can post the link after. Sure. Yeah, so I... So I uh, the beauty of most people being online these days is you can look back and um, and when i when i gave up my job and i actually tweeted a, a brief paragraph of what i wrote to my colleagues on my final day uh, at the pension company nest uh, i was encouraged by a couple of people i think jem was one uh, rupert reed was another they encouraged me to write more about why i'd taken this decision and that your digital footprint allows you to look back on various points of your journey. So I was always an anti, I, I would say always, I, I think I, I've been mainly an anti-war activist, right? Um, through the first Gulf War and the, and the invasion of Iraq in 2003, I was, I was passionate about my activism being against war. Um, but I think I got the climate emergency. I was late to the party and I got the climate emergency in 2015 because I was writing a blog. I, I, I was taking about six months out between jobs and I was writing a blog and it was, it was a sort of silly, trivial, make the world a better place sort of blog. I was writing something every day. I think, I think 365 days to change the world was the sort of inspiration book that I would picked up. So recycle or do this or do that or do the other. And it was about February 2015 that I, I, I wrote about the climate. And the picture I used was Earthrise, this, this first picture of the planet um, from space. And I, I called this blog Stories for My Grandchildren, right? Which if you, some people might know that there was a book by Dr. James Hansen called Storms of My Grandchildren which is a 2008 book about the climate. 
about climate change. So clearly I'd been thinking and inspired by various authors about the climate change. But as I wrote this blog in 2015, as I wrote to my fictitious or hope to have future grandchildren, my kids were, my kids at the time were 15 and, not, and 20, right? So I, I hadn't got grandchildren. The idea is if your kids don't listen to you, then your grandchildren might, right? But I was clearly quite frantic and apologetic to these future grandchildren that we'd really messed up. And so I, I look on that point as saying 2015 was the time that I got it, but I still went back to work for two or three years. And whilst I was following various climate change uh, events on, on social media, I was still busy working again. Uh, and then 2018 is when I, could, I couldn't ignore it any longer. And I think it was the combination of the three things I mentioned, Jem's paper, the IPCC 1.5 report, the heat of the 2018 summer in the UK. But then it was the emergence of Extinction Rebellion and all of a sudden Extinction Rebellion gave me an excuse to do something. Right, you know, there was something for me to do. And, and, and I think that was the final kick up the backside I needed. Okay, well, that's, um, that's a fair point. I mean, at least when we spoke on just there, I already said that to you, but I think uh, it resonates with me and I'm sure it can resonate with a lot of other people. So thanks for, for sharing this part as well. Very interesting. Um, I know you, because we are on the Deep Adaptation Forum, you mentioned you read also the, the paper and it had an impact on you. Um, I think the idea of, I had for organizing the questions for for you and for for the people listening and watching this video is having the the questions ordered listed with the four R's in the paper so resilience relinquishment restoration and reconciliation and I think for um, for this particular format it was interesting for you for us to start with reconciliation because to to make the gap between your former life and your your life now i think it's uh, it's um it's the best way to to kick start this um, this interview um one of the points you you mentioned i think maybe it's on the bbc article that i um, put on the description of this event you mentioned your son was was maybe not too happy with your change of career. And he explained to you, or he was saying you could have changed the, the work from inside being an investment banker or being in finance. Do you think it's true? Or do, what do you think you could have done in terms of reconciliation, which is you know, what could I do what could I make peace with to lessen suffering? Do you think you could have done something during your time as a, in finance? Um, in some ways, no. Uh, incidentally, my son wasn't very happy with me with that quote, actually, on that BBC article. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> he, um, yeah, so, I, I, but I do remember him saying, I, he, he's, he, he's in uh, VFX, visual effects, um, in the um, entertainment and advertising industry. And he did point to certain things that he's doing from a renewable energy, for, they're, they're, they're big users of computer power and processing power, and, and they're, they're trying to be more um, um, sustainable in the energy they're using. Um, we, we talk about Elon Musk a lot, about how much Elon Musk has done potentially to save the planet. I mean, I think we can debate that, but, you know, he's, in, he's, he's clearly in a more sustainable business than pensions, for example. But I don't believe I could have really made a huge change in, in the pension company I was working for. And I actually believe... Um, my ability to potentially influence, and I, I say this really, really humbly, there's not many people who have given up jobs in, in, in the city of London to get arrested and be a full-time uh, volunteer for Extinction Rebellion. So 
in some senses, um, because of that, and for no other reason, I, I've had a bit of a platform in the media on, on opportunities like this to, to talk about it. And I, I, it has allowed me to sort of point the finger a little bit at the finance industry. So I'm, I've, I've been involved, uh, I'm, I'm talking with a few people about whether to start something called Bankers for XR, um, I'm in a sort of business group, business declares climate emergency. I'm on the, I, I'm on the um, advisory board for that. So I think by coming out of the finance industry, um, I potentially had a bigger impact than I would have had if I'd have remained at Nest as a pension company and continued to do the role that I was doing. I wasn't, I wasn't in a particular ESG, ESG type role. So I really was just in a project team. So I, I actually think I did the right thing by leaving because my mind clearly was not uh, focused on my work either. So I think I think I probably did nest a, a, a service by leaving as much as I did myself. <laughs> okay. Um, on this particular point, I, we talked as well on the... Um, on the, um, on Tuesday about that, but sorry, said, Anthony, you... can I just interrupt you because I've just seen something come up on chat. Sorry, I mentioned the word um, ESG, um, environmental, social, and governance. It's it's uh, others will be able to know better than me, but it's 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 basically how companies make sure that they're sustainable, their businesses are sustainable. So I'm sorry for using a bit of jargon. Hey, careful, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, that's fine. I mean, after that, you you mentioned as well, like um, the the role of your family being supportive to you. You said the same for your colleagues, but what what has been the um, when you when you make like um, when you draw some conclusions about living? What has been the reaction of your of your um, former group of people family friends co-workers um not enough i mean i in some senses i i don't think it's me i think i think something's happened i think the emergence of extinction rebellion has meant that this the climate emergency has become a topic of conversation um in 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 a lot over a lot more dinner tables and families and in workplaces than, than it would. And that's, that's, that's the emergence, I, I guess, of Greta Thunberg and Extinction Rebellion. And, and clearly, you know, what feels like an increasingly num an increasing number of natural disasters that seem to be occurring, you know. Um, it, it's still a huge puzzle to me how many of my ex-colleagues and my peers in, a, in and around Southwest London, where I live, um, you know, when I talk to them and they, they joke a little bit and they congratulate me for what I'm doing, but they, they still don't join. And I, I, I'm still shaking my head at that one. Um, there are a lot of people I know that have joined Extinction Rebellion, but I'm still amazed when occasionally I come across somebody who has ne not even heard of Extinction Rebellion. They live in London, right? So I think there's a big, big journey uh, for us all to, you know, there's, there's still a, so much more to do. Um, but uh, I don't have any answers as why, of why people get the climate emergency and yet leave it to others to, um, to try and produce the changes in society that we all need. So that's a real big puzzle to me. Okay, and I know like you, you mentioned like the emergence of um, extension rebellion as one big factor for you to to engage and leave your job. So what what has been the appeal to you in extension rebellion? Uh, well, I, I remember I remember years of being a sort of um, anti-war activist, um, and I've been on a lot of marches where I've been the only one that I know, not, not the only one on the march, thank goodness, but <laughs> um, I've been on marches with a lot of people, but I have been the only one on that march. I've not gone with family and friends. Um, 
and that and and that and that felt quite a, a lonely sort of activism um, because when you actually get the climate emergency, it, it's quite a traumatic and and uh, upsetting experience. You know, clearly grief pay, plays a big part, or it should play a big part in people when they actually get the climate emergency. So. Um, I think one of the attractions for me of Extinction Rebellion is that I'm with a lot of people or I spend a lot of time with people who get it the same as me. And, and in Extinction Rebellion, we, the, one of the big things about this is, is something they call their regenerative culture. So there's an acceptance of the fact that we're in a climate emergency, but there's also an acceptance that what's probably got us here is a toxic society and we probably need to change in all aspects of how we interact with others, how we interact with people outside of our own countries, et cetera, et cetera. And so the big attraction for me is, and, and I say this as somebody who considers, my, considers myself a little bit of an introvert, um, that, you know, having time where you talk to people, cry with cry with each other about the problem that we're in. We don't, Extinction Rebellion isn't just a group of people who go out and block, block the traffic on the streets. It's, it, it's almost a community where we all get it and we're all supporting each other. So it's quite a beautiful thing in some senses to be part of Extinction Rebellion, um, wherever you are in your journey. Okay. And how did you, how did you find them? How did you, hear about them uh so it was mid it was mid october so um they they so extinction rebellion didn't launch until the 31st of october last year and the first time i so i i think i'd read jem's paper around the august time early august um and then george mombio wrote about extinction rebellion in the guardian So it was about the last paragraph of a piece about um, disobedience or rebellion was, was probably the only thing left to people who cared about the environment now. It was, it was like the last chance of Saloon to do something about it. And then suddenly in this final paragraph, he said, that's why on the 31st of October, I will be in Parliament Square for the launch of Extinction Rebellion. And um, I'd never heard of Extinction Rebellion before that. And I was, at the, I was working at the pension company on the 31st of October. So I, I didn't make it to the launch. But two weeks, two weeks later, um, myself and my wife and, and our dog walked out onto Waterloo Bridge and, and blocked the traffic on Waterloo Bridge. And that was the first major action of Extinction Rebellion, the Saturday in November when we blocked five five consecutive bridges across the Thames in London. And there were a number of arrests, arrests that day, but you know, that was, a, that was about three or four hours sitting on, a, on Waterloo Bridge. Um, and, and then suddenly I'm, I'm, I'm sort of part of it, yeah? Because you know, if, you, if you care about the environment and you, you subscribe to the values and behaviors of Extinction Rebellion, you're it, you're a member. There's no, there's no membership fee to pay or a card, a membership card. <laughs> So I'm, so I'm suddenly part of Extinction Rebellion, and as many people who are part of Extinction Rebellion, still happily going off Monday to Friday and working. Okay. Um, maybe that's a, that's a good transition to one of my questions as well. Like, uh, what's, what's changed between your um, working life before, before joining Extinction Rebellion? And what, you, what does your what does your week looks like now so um okay so I, i i still get up quite early in the morning i still spend most of my day in front of a computer um i don't get paid <laughs> for, for what i'm doing i mean some some volunteers get, get living expenses from extinction rebellion but It's based on financial need, and I'm fortunate enough that I, I don't need to claim that from Extinction Rebellion. Um, I think it's, it's more, 
it's more consuming. There, there, there have been times in my career where I've, I've been totally consumed by my job. Um, there was, there was one, one time I remember back in 2010, uh, working for Lloyds Bank, where I'm, I sort of got the five something in the morning train up into London and didn't get home until eight o'clock at night. And I got to the weekend and I was completely exhausted. But in general, it was a job. Um, I went to work, got to work around eight o'clock. I got home about half past five, six, seven o'clock at night. And I could do other things. I think the climate emergency is a little bit different. Once you know, um, it almost consumes you a little bit. Uh, it's, it, it, it's why I consider myself a little bit of a work in progress. So there are times I look at myself and I go, you've, you've, you've got to have a few more boundaries here. <laughs> you can't be this 100% climate activist worrying about the finances at Extinction Rebellion. Um, you're, you've got to remember you're still a husband, you're still a father, you still like to go and play tennis, meet with friends who aren't part of Extinction Rebellion. And so, you know, sometimes I get a little bit out of kilter, but the, the, main, the main thing is I still feel that I'm, I'm working. I'm just working for nothing on something I absolutely passionately believe in. And, and, and I, as I say, I, I, I repeat, I recognize my privilege because not everybody can afford not to have income and, and effectively do what I'm doing. So, you know, I, I do it gladly, but it's, it, 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 it's part of my privilege and my age that, that I find myself in this position. Do you think like maybe in a, in a parallel universe where you wouldn't have been as successful as what you've been before, things would have turned out the same for you? Like if you, if you didn't have such savings, basically, do you think you, you would still have become what you are doing now or maybe different? So, so, so that's, that's a really good question. And, um, it's possible it would be different, but it's possible it wouldn't be different. And let me try and explain what I mean by that. We all go to work for uh, a reason and, and at its very basic level, some, some people go to work in order to pay a mortgage or to um, uh, put food on the table or bring up children or, or whatever. But there are also plenty of people who I think are working really, really hard because of rewards that are going to be achieved 10 years from now, not rewards that are being achieved now, if you know what I mean. So, so it's, it's the reason why a young, recently qualified lawyer will, will work 60 hour, 70 hour weeks because they want to make partner and they want to make partner in 10 years time or 12 years time. And that's the path that they must go through in order to, to reach that point. And, and, that, and it's the same in banking and it's the same in a lot of careers. You, you almost work beyond what is healthy and sensible for some rewards that will happen in 10 or 15 years time. And, and so if I look back now and say, if I was, you know, if, if that's me, if what I'm doing is I'm throwing in all my effort into my career for what I may have 10 years from now, then, then I think the concept of deep adaptation and Jem's paper and near time, near term societal collapse should, should influence whether or not that's the right thing for you. Uh, there's a lot of people who work really, really hard and they have to for food and shelter and, and money. But if, if you are somehow postponing your life, for want of a better word, you're postponing what it is to live a decent life in the hope of future rewards, then suddenly knowledge of deep adaptation is a real challenge to that. So um, I, I don't know if that's making sense, Anthony, that what I'm, what I'm trying to say is, um, yes, I, I, I may have continued to do my job, but, but certainly there are aspects, once you know what, what we may be facing in the future, there are aspects that 
would probably say is, uh, you know, am I in the right career? Am I, have I got the, the right work-life balance, etc.? Andrew. Okay. Hello, Andrew. It's Matt here. Um, can you hear me clearly? Yes, yes. I can. Ah, uh, good, good. Look, thanks very much for hosting this already. It, it, uh, it's a great value. I, I, I want to talk to you as a fellow ex-city worker who's given up or, or quit the, the rat race to, to try and future um, more in line with sort of like the ecological emergency. Personally speaking, I've, I've accrued um, half a career's worth of knowledge and wisdom based in the, in the insurance industry that I was a part of. And now having come out of it, I, I find myself with a lot of knowledge that's not, ne not necessary anymore and a lot of knowledge of the workings of the industry that's suddenly not so relevant anymore. And I'm thinking about where do I take my next steps? Where do I, um, are my efforts best served in um, getting to a position of personal resilience and personal satisfaction in the work that I'm doing? Or it, are my efforts best served going back into my industry and utilizing through a new lens of deep adaptation XR and so on so forth, and actually applying the skills back in the industry that I've been a part of and taking it that way. Because I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at you and, and, and seeing this, this career that you've pursued and now sort of drawn a line under, and, and I wonder if there is a, if you've considered going back into your previous um, industry but with, with, a new, with a new hat on. I wonder if you could speak to that a bit. Yeah, I, so um, I'm very, it's difficult to think for me, and, and I, you, you, may, you may think there's a, there's a place. At this moment in time, I think that the financial services industry mm -hmm. is is not showing the level of leadership that it is. So, so I personally feel with a little bit of, a little bit of credibility and the lingo for want of a better word, that actually my, I, I've got a better influence on the finance industry by standing outside of it and possibly pointing the finger as part of the sort of Extinction Rebellion activism. Right. I, I would I would struggle to think there was a single role in the city of London that I could go in and have a greater impact. And 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 I, I mentioned a little bit earlier on this call that that's possibly because I'm one of the few people I think that have suddenly gone climate emergency, can't work in the financial services industry anymore. Let's go and get arrested on the streets of London. Yeah. If if your journey is similar it's great, we need to band together and think how we can point the finger at, 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 at industry and, uh, and that. I mean, clearly the, the financial services industry are, are not acting as, as they should, but that doesn't mean to say there might be people within the insurance industry that um, could have a real big impact, do their own rebellion from inside. So that there's, a, there's a couple of things. There's one thing that's been set up by, by somebody who's quite close to Extinction Rebellion called truthteller.life. Truthteller.life is the website. And this is an attempt to say that there are people working in financial services who are, who are aware of internal papers and risk analyses that, that the banks themselves or the insurance companies might be discussing about climate change that are just not in the public domain. And it would be really interesting to get to get some of that thinking into the public domain. Yeah. So that that's one way in which. Um, but to answer your question specifically, I think there are, as I've come out of financial services, I think there's lots of skills that can be translated into whether it's just activism or other walks of life or or other jobs. Yeah. 
I, I would really struggle that there are particular roles where you could really go in and make a change yeah. in these big, big financial industries. I hope, I hope that answers your question a little bit. Yeah, well, look, it, it, it's, a, it's a really complex situation. And, and I think for, for, for me personally, I want my future to lie in where I can have the, the greatest impact, whether that's being an activist from within or externally, or even looking at regulation and, and mm. that's a, an avenue to pursue. But I certainly think, you know, this applies specifically to financial, yeah. but you could probably um, cast it a bit wider and, and think about people about who are recognizing the implications of adaptation. Sure. You can be an activist within your own life. Yeah, Anthony's going walkabouts at the moment, I can see. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, sorry, uh, just, uh, I've got the kids at home and they are just waking up from their, from their nap, so uh, okay. I, will, I will have to, I, I'm, I'm just uh, moving from uh, my living room to the bedroom of my children. Uh, it's a bit complicated. Uh, a, I've, I've got twins, so uh, yeah. don't, don't judge me, it's just, it's that. Uh, okay, but, but Matt, your, your point about uh, should I concentrate on deep adaptation for myself? I, Andrew, Andrew I just could, what? Just one thing, it's we have also other questions. So if people are yeah. interested as well, they can just raise their hand and we will come back to that question. I think you got the got another question coming from Andrew. So just keep that in mind. Maybe answer the, the last question from Matt. Uh, take your time, but you, you got another one coming. Okay, so, so Matt, I, you mentioned about, should I concentrate on deep adaptation for myself? You were talking about yourself. I, I still think I'm an absolute baby in this in this regard. I've gone from I've gone from a uh, full time city career to at times full time activism, and, and 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 those boundaries are not right yet. So I I think Gemma's talked about people can go from one form of denial where they don't they don't really appreciate the the the, the, the trouble we're in. And then they, when they find out, they run around in their activism so much that they actually, it's another form of denial. And there are times this year where I felt I have been, I have been too much the other way, if you know what I mean. I realize what's going on, but I'm, I'm not doing that deep adaptation for myself. So I really need to get that right. Yeah, well, okay. I'll, look at, I'll, I'll leave it there, but I'll be very interested to, to get your thoughts specifically on financial services so i i, I will uh, i will message you for okay them. absolutely and we have we have another question from andrew andrew can you hear us yes yes Hello, can you hear me yes yeah good okay um well uh uh i jumped ship from the corporate world in 1977 and have since been working on permaculture work uh ever since and have been a mentor and a coach for lots of people who've been going through transitions, the same transition, exit strategies from well-paying jobs into a life of uh, the, the, the somewhat chaotic and possibly quite frugal life of becoming an activist of some sort. And one of the models that we have found absolutely the most useful comes from a guy called Ralph Bridges, who wrote a book called Transitions back in the 1980s, who said the first thing you need to do is to work out how to stop doing what you're doing now. You don't need to work out what to do next. You just need to work out how to stop doing what you're doing now. Allow yourself to slide into a place of chaos. Okay. Crash about in there for a while and maybe a year or two until you discover what it is that you want to do next. Okay. And then it becomes quite clear what you need to do. So you need to be prepared. It's kind of like a training for what we all need to be able to do around deep adaptation anyway, which is to survive a period of extreme chaos when you've got no idea what's happening, no idea how you're going to make your living. Okay. But you have at least stopped being part of the problem and you're now 
in a free space where you can start thinking about how you can be part of the solution. Mm. So I'm just offering that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we're going now with Alex for another question. Hi, hi everyone. Hello, Lloyd's uh, banker. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you can stay at Lloyd's and change the world, it turns out. No, I don't know. But I was I was going to provide a counter example because I, I'm asking my question, myself this question quite a lot about whether to stay at Lloyd's and I, and I do think I'm making a difference. Uh, so I haven't got a question. Is it all right if I provide a, a counter example? Of course. Um, so so I, I'm working at Lloyd's and it's a big organisation. So lots of different people doing lots of different roles, but my history has been involved in, in change and projects and uh, latterly I've been involved in a large cultural transformation project at Lloyd's which has changed in the entire organisation about how they do work um, and I guess the interesting thing is in some ways is I can, I can thank Lloyd's for actually taking me along a sort of learning journey and path um, so you wouldn't expect, I certainly wouldn't expect an organisation like Lloyd's having worked there a lot in the past so I'm a freelancer that they would be a trigger for personal growth, but they have been. Um, you know, in some ways, I'm grateful for that. But what that's taken me to is is um, a lot of questioning, a lot of questioning of assumptions about the system we're operating within, um, realising there are a lot of problems that uh, we're facing, of, and climate crisis being an outcome of that. Um, inequality and lots of other sort of societal problems being a problem about the system we're operating within and um, which I assumed was good and, and a really simple quick example of that I suppose is uh, uh, for, for me at least the learning was that um, I, I figured out early on in work that uh, there was a bit of deceit and lying required to get on and uh, you couldn't really be yourself and be honest there was there's definitely a need to put on a sort of false face to be successful and in the last few years I realized well a, a, a I don't I've never wanted to do that, but B, it's it's a lie that you need to be doing that. And in fact, if you're going to be effective in an organisation, from a business and a business, even a commercial perspective, um, you need to create an environment of sort of psychological safety and trust, where people can be themselves, in order to actually be even better employees. So I guess that's sort of a, a, a something I discovered. Um, along the way but I guess in terms of Lloyd's um, we're part of this cultural transformation so um, I am I am hopeful that some of the changes that may result from what we're trying to do will actually change Lloyd's uh, significantly and I need to be a bit careful about what I'm saying here as I realize this but uh, <laughs> some of the uh, you know some of the the things that hold us back in in terms of having a sort of power hierarchy and so on Actually, sort of bad for an organisation ultimately, anyway. So, um, where am I driving with this? I think there's potential as part of my role within Lloyd's is to change people's perspective and go through a learning and growth sort of journey in the same way as I have. Um, when when this sort of whole thing started, this um, conversation, there was a, there was a, a brief comment on psychology and how changing people's minds. And Andrew, you talked about how, which I think we've all experienced, people agreeing very vigorously with what you're doing and then doing nothing about it. Well, I say nothing, but apparently not joining Extinction Rebellion, which seems to be, you know, well, that's, that's surely a crazy thing. That's, surely, that's, that's the wisest response to, if you're recognizing there's a crisis. But in some ways, <clears throat> excuse me, it's about helping people follow their own journeys and, uh, and raise their own level of consciousness and being sympathetic to the fact that that's what actually happens. We can't all follow the same path. Um, I feel I'm entering the rambling territory, but um, what I'm trying to say is I think there is a possibility within my role and a very concrete recent example is I'm actually interested, I'm actually about to try and introduce permaculture sort of design, sort of design principles within the organisation and, and Nenad, Nenad and I have just been started working together so I'm looking for opportunities and because of where I am in the organisation and being a sort of pivotal place as part of my team to change the way they work we can question some basic assumptions and one of those is potentially using permaculture on its ethical basis 
for for sort of uh, tackling how we work within Lloyd's. Um, so um, I'm not sure how well I've explained that, but I'm saying there's a point, there's an opportunity to change the organisation within. So it, it, it's great. It's great to hear that. I mean, so so to me, we've got this. We've got this deep adaptation, the need, need for all of us to change from with, within and how we interact as a society. And then you've got, I guess it's my Extinction Rebellion part, which is to say we're in a climate emergency, our, our house is burning down. And we may be so much into the deep adaptation side of things that we actually go, it's too late. We're, we're just going to be part of this deep adaptation bit. Yeah. Or, or that there's some sort of hybrid where you actually say, yeah, I need to do this. This is really important. But on this, but this side, I really need to, I need to act as though the house is burning down. Yeah. And, and, and this is not a criticism, but the one thing I didn't hear from you was the emergency. Yeah. And, and clearly Lloyd's bank as the biggest domestic bank in the UK has the chance to be a huge leader on the climate emergency. So there was, there would, you know, how close would be Lloyd's Bank to declaring a climate emergency? How close would it be to decarbonizing its own operations within the next few years? Yeah. How, how close would it be to provide real leadership by saying, we're no longer going to fund fossil fuel infrastructure that if it continues if it, I mean, I saw a graph just in the last few days, you know, the 1.5 degree ambition, the two degree ambition, and then what the current <laughs> finance, you know, what the current policy is funding in terms of fossil fuel. So, so I don't want to be a big, I don't want this to be a big no. debate about Lloyd's, but no. I, I do think um, banks in general, because they're such huge parts of our economy, have the chance to show real leadership yeah. in this area. Yeah. And so I would I, I would say, to what extent are the hundred thousand staff of the Lloyd's Banking Group engaged in climate emergency, and their senior executives leading on this issue? That would be the the big thing I would I would be looking for Lloyd's to to do at this moment in time. And I'll just yeah, and, and obviously yeah, let's not make it about that organisation, but I think it probably parallels society in that there are lots of people. Uh, you know, who are part of an organisation who are actually sympathetic. Some people I know who are acting, um, but they don't have the levers of power. And in the same way as Boris Johnson or whoever you want to point out as a leader isn't acting, um, I, I see the same situation in sort of large organisations as well. Um, but I guess the question has to boil down to what can you do individually? Um, and this, this is a paradox for me is do you change the system from within or do you step outside and try to create a new one? And, and I can't, my answer personally is, is you, you try and do both because you've got to do whatever you can. Um, and if that's a, if that's a, a way of influencing from within, to be frank at the moment, I haven't, um, I haven't taken the routes that Andrew was referring to where you enter into chaos, uh, um, <laughs> As you start to transition, and I'm I'm really interested in that actually to understand more about that um, because I'm in the same position. I have a you know I have a family, I have children, I have a, a child, I've got personal responsibilities which I can't sort of abandon. So um, although I would try, uh, my wife called me radicalised the other day. I'd like to do something quite radical, but um, I don't want to damage the people around me in the process. So that's a sort of paradox. So I'm um, there is an element of um, yes, I have to continue doing this. Um, because I haven't figured out the route out, the safe route out of this. And while I'm here, I'll continue to, um, you know, make an impact as I can, make some noise. And ultimately, if, if, I, don't, if I don't see integrity, um, I might have to take some different action. I might have to make some different choices. But I'd like to <sighs> say... So. <laughs> Well, I think you're, I think you're the, definitely not alone in this uh, in this path. I, I think everybody is trying to figure out a way of, um, as you say, being outside of the system and also like uh, doing, staying in the same position out of fears. I think I don't know. I'm saying out of fears, like my personal fears. I would say, but 
as I say, having uh, having children like change change a bit uh, for the car that dealt in my position. I, would say. I think we got never on with a question for you and you. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Sorry. Oof. I'm not used to Zoom yet. So <laughs> thanks, Alex. Thank you. Nedad, you're on. Yeah, sorry, I, I had somebody on my door <laughs> at the very moment. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, no Andrew, Andrew, I'm curious about what can you translate from your peace or anti-war activism to your current uh, way of doing stuff? But before uh, I hear you, I would like to share a little bit uh, as a comment, yeah? So I'm calling from Zagreb, Croatia. And I'm also a permaculturist, and <clears throat> my my transition was later than Andrew's. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a different generation, but uh, uh, it, it was happening for me during the societal collapse. Uh, we had uh, wars here, beginning of 90s, and um, what I want to say that there is this difference in a level of choice. Uh, you have when you are dealing with your own uh, cognitive dissonance only, and when you are dealing at the same time with the societal collapse. Uh, the level of choice is very, 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 very different. And uh, because this uh, transition was happening for me, for example, that was when I started working in, in environmental organizations. Yeah? And my transition took quite a long time, uh, 10 or 20 years maybe. Yeah. So um, I'm curious, can you translate anything from your peace activism to current situation? Because what I see with deep adaptation is much more like being in the middle of the war conflict, not, not as a, being a peace activist in a, a country where there is no uh, war conflict. Mm -hmm. Ooh, that's a tough question. Um, I like that, Menon. Yeah, I, I sort of, I sort of think, in some senses, that um, activism about the environment or about the climate should be a lot easier than activism about uh, anti-war. I mean, in, on one level, we should all be against war, right? But, but my anti-war activism felt to me to be a lot more political than my climate activism is. I, I actually believe that Extinction Rebellion is a apolitical organization. It would be very arrogant to think it's only progressive or left of center uh, activists who care about their children and care about the planet and care about a decent society for everyone. So. So I think from that point of view, I'm um, climate activism should be a lot easier because it, 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 it's, it's affecting all of us and, and will affect uh, us all. But, but, but the parallels are that my anti-war activism was just one particular uh, cause that I, 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 was in, I was supporting or I, a position I was taking the thing, the thing about climate and environmental act, activism is, it, it really is it encompasses everything. So, so if you care about, if you care about inequality, if you care about war, if you care about uh, gender rights and that, all of these other things are things that are undermined by climate, the climate emergency and societal breakdown. So. So it's, it's almost the tsunami that's going to swamp everything else. And it's one of the reasons why Extinction Rebellion have, have attempted to um, not just try and attract supporters to their own cause, but to reach out to other groups. So at the recent um, rebellion in October in London, we reached out to the, uh, the animal, uh, animal rights movement and they were not Extinction Rebellion, but they called themselves Animal Rebellion. They, they signed up to the three demands of Extinction Rebellion 
even though they were a separate movement because they they were convinced or they recognized that if if society make the changes that we all need to make we need to move to a predominantly plant-based diet then a lot of their aims about animal welfare and animal active uh, animal rights will actually be achieved by that so it's a way in which we've reached out we call it our movement of movement strategy um so you know, I, I don't know if that's answering your question at all, but uh, it was probably a yes, yes, it was very good. Thank you. A stumbling yeah. attempt to, to to do it. We, we're all part. This is we're all part of the solution here. It's why that it's why I look back at my colleagues or my ex colleagues in business, and I say, it, it it it's not for me to criticise because I feel I'm really late to the party. You know, you know, in terms of. You know, another Andrew talked about, he's been doing something since 1977. I, I wish, I wish I hadn't been so late to the party, but, you know, it doesn't matter when you arrive. The question is, everyone needs to get on board here because this is not, this is not something that three or 5% of the population is going to change. It's all of us. It's all us, all of us being part of the solution. Yeah. So you said that uh, Extinction Rebellion for you is non-political. I would kind of agree with that, but I would tweak it. I think because it's about existential issues, it is so political that's beyond politics. Yes, yes, that's a good, that's a good point. And we have another question from Andrew. Another Andrew, over the same Thanks. Andrew. <laughs> Thanks for that for your it's question. A, it's the same Andrew. Hello, Andrew. I'm happy not. I'm happy not to go if anybody else has got a, a, a point, but I, I work a lot in education. In fact, I'm at a little university called Gaia University that is specifically for people who are seeking to make these kinds of transitions and get on board with work that's to do with ecosystem restoration and all of that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, so uh, when I'm talking to my colleagues in uh, mainstream academic world of of, of uh, you know of whom I have a few what I what I tell them is something like it's, it's kind of like saying something about the relationship between people who are working inside the system for reform and people who are working outside the system uh, where actually the, the climate the, the 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 flow of wealth is much reduced as soon as you step outside of the system you're in a place where uh, you have to make your own living and that that can be quite tough. Okay, so one of the suggestions I make to my academic friends is what they need to be doing, because here in the US, for example, there's this massive deconstruction of the university system. There's something like 50% over capacity. So there are all these colleges closing down all over the place. They need to be just as interested in making sure something outside their system exists and is healthy, so that there's somewhere that they can jump to when their college closes or collapses, okay, uh, as they do attempting to reform from the inside. So inside reformers need to be finding ways to financially support the outside leading edge activists is what I'm kind of getting at, all right? So, so finding a way of flowing some of your funds just in, out there to support people like me who are working on the edge would be very helpful. <laughs> Check. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. Oh, or cash. Cash or check. <laughs> but I think we have some other question. That's a that's an interesting system as well. Is it something that you've put in, you've managed to put in place or is it something that you are working on for the funding? Is that a question for me, me Anthony, or for no, the other Andrew? No, for the other Andrew. Sorry, Andrew. It's a, it's a continuous question for those of us who are working in the outside area. You know, for example, <clears throat> there's this new ecosystem restoration camps movement that's getting going. Got a good camp going in Spain and another one happening in Mexico and a couple happening here in California and so on. Really exciting, bringing volunteers out into the rural areas to rehabilitate forests and uh, rebuild streams and so on and so forth. Great work. And yet... It's continuously struggling to find finance, okay? And it's, it's absolutely clear that the 
mainstream governmental organizations and so on find it very difficult to put money into those sorts of things. So we are all scratching around. We all, we're all, you know, I, when, when I finish this call, I'll be going over there to build, build my mycorrhizal compost bin so that we can plant some trees up on the hills and so on and so forth. And we'll be doing that voluntarily, uh, all funded out of our minimum levels of income. Okay. So that's what I want. So Lloyd's bank, anybody else who's working in the financial industry, anybody who's working in, uh, 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 the, um, insurance industry, insurance industry, especially what you need to do is you need to be investing large sums of money in ecosystem restoration. Okay. Give it over. We got, we know what to do with it. We can I rephrase that in one, uh, uh, short sentence. So uh, for both Andrews, uh, we need to look for within the system, outside of the system partnerships, you know, something like public private partnerships, but within the system, outside of the system partnerships. I'm looking for a, I'm looking for a sympathetic uh, organizations in the business world law firms, uh, accountancy firms, uh, banks or insurance companies to uh, possibly second, second individuals or volunteers into uh, Extinction Rebellion to help us put in place <laughs> our sort of finance team and our accounting and stuff like that. I mean, I, I think that would be a fantastic way in which they would support the climate um, emergency by actually giving some of their resources and, and that in support of possibly the, you know, the most activist movement at this moment in time in, in the UK at least. Um, so that I'm certainly looking to companies to sort of support us in that way. Okay. I think we are just around about the hour. Um, to everybody, with us today if we have some other questions left for andrew it's only men who have spoken today anthony i'm i'm really keen we, we, we one one thing we have to recognize in extinction we try and recognize in extinction rebellion is it shouldn't always be the men talking so i'd love it if there was a a, a woman who wanted to ask a question it would be it would help me <laughs> of course no pressure to... No pressure. No, no pressure. No pressure. Uh, I think we have a question from, yes, Matt Croston's friend. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, I'm Julia. I, um, my question is, so I'm, I'm an architect, and about two years ago, I, I basically had a very strong sense that the world was crumbling, and I was sitting there designing kitchens, and... It was like a physical repulsion that forced me to leave and step out. And I've spent two years, I've come to Schumacher College, I've learned about horticulture. However, I'm now facing the next step, which is very daunting, because I feel like I've been in two years of chaos, not really having a fixed address, trying to find a way forwards. Um, and unfortunately, the system that currently exists is a lot easier to step back into than to keep going forwards into this kind of deep adaptation approach. And particularly as a single person with one income. And I don't know, I just wonder if there's any advice for how you keep with the chaos or and transition that forward into something new, um, rather than going back to the safety net of the system, even though I know I don't want to be part of it. Oh, that's a question of me. I, I, I feel so bad. So did I hear your name correctly? Juliet, yeah? Julia. Julia. So I'm sorry, Julia. Um, yeah, I, I, so at, at this stage, I feel, I feel a bit of a fraud because of the stage of my life that, that, that I'm in. So I'm, I'm thinking about um, to what extent do I continue this activism with Extinction Rebellion? Um, I, I, there are lots of wonderful young people who are volunteering at, uh, for Extinction Rebellion at the moment, getting some volunteer living expenses. Um, 
how, how much longer should there be climate activism, for example, for the, you know, is it, is it another 12 months? Is it another two years before? I mean, if we're having these same conversations in 2021, there's a, there's a part of me that says we should just, we just move to deep adaptation because the world, the world's not listened. You know, it really does feel like we're in this small window to, to sort of attempt to do something. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm going to ramble, and 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 it's it's a question I'm going to have to think about, Julia, because the the good thing I think the good thing that I I think is is really really important is I feel I'm really late to this party, and at my age, I wish I'd I wish I'd found out ten years earlier. Um, what I think you have is time in a way that I haven't got time, if you know what I mean. <laughs> that that I actually think. You can you can find paid work that is meaningful that that it, it it actually does some of those things that you need, which is to look after yourself and to you know build a life. I I think what what a realization of the climate emergency does for me is there are some some careers that that seventy eighty hours a week for a law firm they are they they're yesterday's careers. I really I really believe that. I think that. I think there are careers where you can get pleasure and you can support yourself. And then there are other careers that are just old, old 20th century type careers now. So if, if you start to think about it's the life that I lead, live in the next 30 years that is going to define my life and business as usual is gone, then there's almost no worry about what, what, what life looks like when you're 60 in your case. I mean, when I'm 60, it's only seven years from now. I, I don't know if I'm making some sense, but but it it it, it it's a, you're already on the path, and you don't have all the answers. But I don't have all the answers either. And it sounds like you're doing, you're asking the right questions, even if you're not sure about what the right answers are. Yeah, I think it's just I think it's when fear, fear, I suppose, yeah, fear takes over, doesn't it? And there's fear, there's both the kind of existential fear, and there's also the day-to-day -day fear. <laughs> and it's it's sort of it depends what what you're feeling, which fear you want to be kind of. Yeah, yeah. All, all, all I know is, sorry, I didn't mean to talk over you. Julia, I think today's celebrity, today's materiality, today's, we look at people, business leaders or pop stars as being the people to aspire to. I actually think the, wor the world is going to very quickly transition to people who are good listeners and have skills and act take active part in community and know how to build things so i think you as an architect if you if that's your training albeit kid not not kitchens but perhaps buildings i mean i think that they're, they're, these are the people that are going to be valued people who can grow food for example people who can oh, grow things yeah because yeah, i have i've also been working on community land trust projects so that that's I suppose building community um, and kind of yeah, getting land ownership to be more democratic. So I think yeah, I, 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 sometimes. I, I have to hope. I have to hope that the world. I, I don't have this hopium, right? But I, I have to help, hope that the the world is going to get it, and then things are going to move really, really quickly. Um, and, and, and so if the world gets it, then, then I think there's going to be lots of exciting ways in which people who have got it for longer than other people who are now running, running around thinking, what do we do? What do we do? There, there will be opportunities for you to play an active part in, you know, what societies need to look like 10, 15, 20 years from now. Thank you. <laughs> we have another question from Garen for you, Andrew. Thanks, Julia. So it's actually from Brent. It's from Brent. Sorry, I, I know Sorry. It. I thought it was from Karen. <laughs> so maybe that qualifies me. Uh, so first of all, uh, Andrew, I would like to commend you on what you've done. That's a, uh, a very bold step uh, to give up your career in uh, in pursuit of what you believe is very the very right thing to do. Um, personally, I, I think that you know both you, uh, Andrew, and Alex are very much um on the same page you feel like you can make impact you've decided to move outside your 
um, your career to do that. Um, Alex has decided to stay in his career. And I, I believe that we need both of those. I believe we need people, right, who, who, are, who are outside and inside because we all know nothing happens unless we get inside. Right. I mean, um, driving business to change means that um, we either have to legislate it or they need an incentive to change, which is obviously usually money. Um, you know, and, and we see that innovation, you know, like I think of Impossible Burger, for instance. Right. They're, they're providing an alternative. They're not interested in feeding vegans. They're interested in getting people off of meat. So that's some innovation, you know. Um, so, you know, that's obviously somebody on the inside who, uh, who gets it. Um, so I think that we need kind of both. And more importantly, as we alluded to earlier, we need both to work together, right? Those people on the outside, you, Andrew, now, to work with people like Alex on the inside, um, uh, you know, to come up with solutions who have, you know, drank the Kool-Aid. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'll just jump in there just for another female voice. I think that being, I, I have one of those ESG type roles. So I work in sustainable investing. Um, and I have a few friends that have moved to the outside and are, you know, very, um, um, you know, activists and they, you know, agitators. And it's actually beneficial, you know, to have people like Andrew on the outside, kind of keeping us honest. Like each day I wake up and I ask myself, am I, you know, with given my experience and my capabilities, am I being bold enough? Am I doing enough? Am I being courageous enough? Am I being clear enough? Um, so just, you know, because I've thought of myself, where can I have the most impact inside, outside? And I'm like, okay, am I just justifying staying in the role? But, um, you know, like Ren says, and I tend to talk to him a lot, <laughs> um, they, they do compliment each other. So I tend to yes. work. Yeah, so so I think they're really good points. Um, I think because because of this sort of notoriety, for want of a better word, of suddenly deciding I could no longer do the job I was doing, and then being arrested three times this year, um, I've been invited to a few things. So I was at, I was at a sustainable business conference in um, in Madrid in October, and the CEO of uh, Beyond Meat. I think the maker of the Impossible Burger was was actually one of the speakers at this conference, and I I sort of gave gave an, an opening talk at the beginning of that. It was followed by, you know, Deputy Chief Technology uh, at NASA for 25 years. You know, it's bizarre. I've also been on panels at other ESG or sustainable business type conferences, and it, it's really liberating to actually <laughs> sort of stand stand up for want of a better word and go the house is on fire we're we're all burning <laughs> you know so so i think it has helped that i i have stepped outside and i'm i'm looking back i have to be a little bit careful how i actually play that card and not play it too much but um yes i i agree it's uh, i've had some great great conversations with some really interesting people and as a result of that they published articles and there's articles coming out. I think this guy called Robert Eccles in, in the U S who's big sustainable business guy, really well connected. He's going to be posting a piece on his blog in the next uh, 24, 48 hours, um, which, which talks about being on the right side of history. And he's, he's using the engagement or the fact that I've met him and, and that to sort of challenge the investment community. So, so while while I still have that impact, I, I you know, I, I, I sort of try and play my part. Is, is everybody finding what their part is and just playing playing the best set of the best hand they can from the cards that are given them? Well, thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Karen and Brent. Um, do we have more questions for Andrew? I don't want to be overstepping on your time. I know it's a Saturday as well. Well, maybe I will go for one, just waiting to see if other people will have a last question. 
that would be my last one. Um, given the financial context in the world right now, what's your perspective on a potential economic crisis and the impact it could have also on climate emergency? So, um, okay, so let me, let, me, let me tell you very briefly about my view on financial markets. Uh, back in the late 90s, everybody realized there was a bubble forming in technology stocks. There was one particular asset manager who was in a very influential position in one of the big fund managers running some big pension scheme uh, funds who basically said, I'm going to start withdrawing from uh, technology stocks. But, but this might have been 1998, and he was about 12 months too early. So the, the markets, can, technology stocks continued to rally. And so his performance, it, it was, he underperformed everybody else. And I think, I think the reason I mention this story is people can believe that um, there is a right, right steps to take in terms of investment and asset management. But that doesn't mean to say that anybody's brave enough to take them, that, that as long as everybody else is doing it, there's a herd mentality. And I, I feel this a little bit about um, uh, the funding that's still going in. I mean, I mean the, fund, the bank's funding of fossil fuel infrastructure has gone up from 2016 to 2017 to 2018. It's going up. It's going in the wrong direction. And it's going in the wrong direction because lots of, lots of the finance industry is, is governed by short-term interest. It's all short-term. They don't, they don't look to the longer term. And so I do think there will be some bad times ahead for stock markets and whatever. I mean, there's, there's two alternatives here. Business as usual is finished, in my opinion, which means people act as though business as usual is going to continue until everybody realizes together it can't continue and then there's a crash or the pressure um, the pressure uh, put on governments by Fridays for Future and Greta and Extinction Rebellion suddenly starts to take an impact in which case the stock markets will realize that business as usual is no longer a possibility so I think there are troubled times ahead for financial markets um, the question is, what is what is the trigger for for for, for, for this to happen? Um, and you know, I I don't know, Anthony. I'm not sure I've answered the question, but but it, you know, it's going to be rocky. It's not just financial. It's not financial markets. It's going to be natural disasters. It's going to be a shortage of food at periods of time. And it's a question of how societies come together to get through, you know, these troubling times that are ahead. It's not that they're not going to happen or are they going to happen or are they not going to happen? They are going to happen. The question is, are we ready for them when they happen? And, um, and I guess that's why I run around and try and create publicity on the streets of London getting arrested. And I guess it's why, you know, forums like this exa exist because what we're all trying to do is we're trying to collectively be prepared for what lies ahead whatever that may look like well that was uh, maybe another with a question though. a question but a comment i think uh, i don't know is very important element of uh, deep adaptation because it opens space for collective intelligence and emergence. So, uh, you know, uh, it's good to say, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Well, for um, maybe last parting words, I think I um, would like to thank everybody for joining us today with Andrew. Um, hope you've got um, hope you, you've had some new insights from this conversation. Maybe it gave you food for thought for your for your future steps in your careers. So hope you you managed to to get that from us today. And maybe Andrew, 
last on the last passing words, maybe last comments and where can people find you if they want to keep in contact with you? Twitter, LinkedIn. Uh, so, so yeah, thank you everyone for being part of this call. And um, I, I hope I said a couple of things that might have been useful. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn, Andrew Medhurst, and um, Twitter, A N D M E D H. And if anybody wants to sort of extend the conversation and have separate bilateral conversations, I'm I'm more than happy to do that. And oh, I'm, sure I'm, I'm sure I'm going to learn as much from from you lot as I <laughs> that you're going to learn from me. I'm sure. So uh, thank you for your time, everybody. Andrew is also part of the Deep Adaptation Forum now from this week. <laughs> so you, we can continue the conversation. Also, people have questions. You can just continue the conversation with the link of the event. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Anthony, thank you for initiating and hosting this. You're welcome. Thanks very much, Nenad. Have you. a good Bye. Saturday, everyone. Have a good Thank weekend. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks.